Okay, good morning, everyone. We greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, we are in number 11 of our series of 12 studies in the Minor Prophets. And I do believe it has been, for myself, certainly encouraging, informative, and I pray for you also. Um, you could turn to the book of Zechariah, second last book in the Old Testament. Uh, while we've been in this series of the Minor Prophets, book number 12, 11 now, we've also had a little mini-series, a series within a series. We've been looking at building the house of God, and this is number three or four in the series, Building the House of God. A little while ago, we looked at the Church of God, um, the purchase, the very costly price, the Church of God. And now it is Christ's cherished possession. And now it was uh, such a tremendous, we are his chosen people, and such a tremendous costly price was paid for this church of God. And the last time when we looked at the book of Agai, we were asked to consider our ways when it comes to building the church of God. We were called to consider our attitude, and then we were called to consider our blessing. So we continue in this line of thought in the series of the Minor Prophets, building up the Church of God. And let's start off by reading verse 1 in chapter 1 of the book of Zechariah. And we do trust and pray that the Lord will bless our time together. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet. Now, following the 70 years of Babylonian exile, the uh, nation of Israel was allowed to return back home. We know this was, as we read also in Haggai, Ezra precipitated by the decree that King Cyrus made. So, well, as soon as they returned, one of the first tasks they undertook was to rebuild the temple. And the first group of exiles that were led back to Jerusalem by Zerubbabel. And they, while they were quick to build the altar, we read, and the foundation of the temple, but they very soon after that faced resistance by several adversaries, which then resulted in long delays. So that even when those obstacles were removed, they just became very lazy. And apathetic and for 16 years just let it lie the way it was. So to encourage Zerubbabel and Joshua and others, God sent two prophets to them at that time to preach, to convict them, to encourage them, Agai and Zechariah. Now Agai was the older man and he just preached for a short period from August to December in that year of 500 and uh, 20 BC, and we heard last time that he preached three messages, consider your ways, consider your attitude, and consider your blessings. Now, in between the second and the third messages, this would have been around November 520 BC, as he was ending off with his short ministry of three months, we find that Zechariah, now a young man, you read in Zechariah 2 verse 4, a young man appeared on the scene and started his ministry. But he, on the other hand, preached for a long time, perhaps even two to three years, maybe a little bit more, not fully so, but he preached for a long time. And um, you could almost say that this young man's ministry was a sequel to what Agai had preached. Now, we're going to look at this book of Zechariah. It is one of the longest of the Minor Prophets, 14 chapters long, and no doubt one of the most obscure of the Minor Prophets. When I use the word obscure, amongst all believers, especially evangelical, not especially, but even evangelical believers who do read the Old Testament and do read the Prophets, kind of struggle with this one, the Minor Prophets, because sure, it's, it's really difficult, to be honest. And um, many commentators actually say that this book of uh, Zechariah is amongst the most difficult in the Old Testament. Now, as you read it, and if you have read it slowly and carefully, you'll feel 
you'll find that it's apocalyptic in nature. Delhi it comes down to end times. It is filled, filled like Ezekiel and like Daniel, the two other Old Testament books. It is so filled with symbolic visions, symbolic visions of what is going to come. And particularly, please bear in mind as you read this book on your own and study it. It is very messianic in nature. And there are some amazing references that speaks to the coming Messiah. And it can be compared to the book of Isaiah in its messianic nature. Uh, one thing I learned in reading and studying and preparing over the last many weeks for this book, I battled with how to present it. Uh, certainly possible to, to, to summarize 14 chapters in one session. It is absolutely possible. Um, I realized one thing, it has to be approached with a great sense of humility. You can't assume to know. You can't assume that you've got a handle of the book. And so I'm just really going to look up and zoom in on some a few points out of the very, very many prophecies, messianic references, uh, historical references, uh, lessons to Israel, lessons to us. I would say there is one year worth of study. It's, it's almost as difficult as the book of Revelation in some ways um, to study this properly. So I'm essentially today going to go back to our theme that we are in building the church of God because essentially this is the core message of the book of Zechariah. Uh, if we just hang on to just that thought, they were God's people. They, for 16 years, had let this temple just fall apart that they were supposed to build. They were discouraged. They were had not had enough resources. They were almost defeated in their spirit. And he just lay there. God sent Agai and he stirred up his spirit and he got them to go and they started to build. But things were not quite right in the inside as they were starting this work. So Zechariah comes to deal with these few issues and to con get them to continue to be encouraged to build the house of God. And really, these are 10 points that I've chosen that I'm going to go through reasonably fast, um, doing it slightly different in that I'm not going through the full purview of the book. You'll see that uh, Zechariah has 10, um, eight visions in one night. In one night, he has eight visions and uh, I'm not even going to go through some of those visions. So. If you're waiting for me to talk about horses and chariots and flying scrolls and what do they all mean, and the man that's measuring all of Jerusalem, you're not going to get uh, anything from me on those lines today, but we're really going to focus. It's very appropriate. I think the Lord has led us to this time. we coming out of two years of COVID. Our church has been largely affected, although blessed, but affected. We've lost believers. Well, we've lost, heaven's gained. In 2020 and 2021, four of our core faithful believers went home to glory. We've lost four or five families who've moved on and relocated. And so we left with a small core group uh, that have to gird up the loins, will have to be committed, dedicated, faithful, will have to work hard. It can be extremely discouraging. So I think it is very appropriate that the Lord has brought us to this point to study this particular book. As we see the encouragement that Zechariah brings to this discouraged people of God, and may we take these applications as we just quickly look at, almost glance at what it was to Israel, and then perhaps focus more on each point, what it means to us. So please bear with me. I hope to not take too long, but I want to go through these 10 points. And um, may we be encouraged and if convicted, if necessary, be encouraged that as we look forward to 2022, 2023, the next few years, as we consolidate, as we rebuild, as God uses us to rebuild this church, may we draw many principles from this lesson today that would help us to do so. Now, firstly, let's read together chapter 1 and verse 3. 
I'm uh, just picking out one verse and here in chapter 1, verse 3. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Now, in this first part of chapter 1, there are quite a few verses I'm not referring to all of them. We find that God inspires Zechariah as he preaches to the nation of Israel or the remnant that have come back to Jerusalem and in, in, his, in his mission to encourage them. We find first a call to repentance. He comes to the Israelites, the Jews, and he says, you know what, before you continue, a guy has stirred up your spirit and see you want to go into this building. But before you do so, there is something that is hindering this work of rising up the church of God properly. And that is some hidden sin. That is some unconfessed things. Your fathers really hurt God. They made God so angry. They resisted God. They rejected God. They were punished for it. They were put into exile. You've come back. You want to burn, but there's some things you haven't resolved yet. And we find that he calls them in this first chapter to repentance. And he says they are so important that you repent of your old ways before you build the church of God. And so that was the starting point for Zechariah's ministry. Is it the starting point for you and I here at Bernardino? Perhaps we've come as this poor group, determined, we've resolved, we want to go forward in 2022, we want to be faithful, we want to build the house of God, we want to be faithful in ministry. But the Lord is saying, as he said to Israel, and perhaps saying to each one of us today, we cannot build the house of God, we cannot build our own spiritual lives, our walk. We cannot build as a couple, married couple. We cannot build as a family. And most especially, we cannot build as a church unless we repent from the things that we perhaps did wrong, the mistakes that we made in the past. And God is saying to us here at Bernardio today, let's make a clean start, brothers and sisters. We are all sinners. We have all messed up in our personal lives, in our faith, in our relationships. There are many things we've done. Some of us have been cold in our relationship to God. Some of us have been apathetic to our involvement in the local church here. Some of us have not been faithful in leading and praying. Some of us have just made mistakes financially, career-wise. Some of us have done different things. We've heard some people around the way. Some of us have been arrogant, perhaps abrasive in the way we carried ourselves in the past. And the Lord is saying, we've come to a new point in the radio assembly. It's a new start for us. It's a core group. Before we can start rebuilding, before God can use us to build, whatever it is personally, individually, as a couple, as a family, let's just take a moment and think of those mistakes of those wickedness, of that rebellion, of that disobedience that we may have had in the past, the wrong attitudes, the wrong mindsets, may we bring it and leave it at the foot of the cross today. The Lord says, return to me wholeheartedly, with all your heart, your soul, your mind, come back, repent of your sins, confess it. Let's make a clean start as an assembly. Let's make a clean start as individuals. We cannot go forward. We cannot rebuild the way that God wants us to build. Lest we repent, confess, and start fresh. A call to repentance to the people of Israel. And a call to repentance for every one of us who know and love the Lord. And then immediately afterwards we find in chapter 2. That there is a confidence of the restoration that follows. A confidence of the restoration that comes from repenting and making right with God. And God said to these people in Israel, these Jews, you see, if you want to rebuild, you need to have a freedom in your spirit. 
You need to have the joy of the Lord. You need to have a certain confidence about you that you have the blessing of the Lord in the work that you're going to do. Because in that lies the freedom of the spirit, the freedom to build. And the Lord says in two, chapter 2 and verse 5, for, for I, says the Lord, will be a wall of fire all around her, speaking of Jerusalem, and I will be a glory in her midst. And then verses 8 and 9, just down, good. For thus says the Lord of hosts, he sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against him. You see, he called him to repentance and said, If you repent, I'll be the wall around you. I will edge you in. I will protect you. You will become the apple of my eye. You are so precious. Our brother Alan spoke this morning about his eyesight going. He needs cataract treatment. He said, young people, guard your eyesight. I was joking with Chanda. And I said, my writing in my Bible, you can probably read from where you sit. And yet I still need glasses to read it. That very center of the eye is so precious. The pupil, the part that opens and closes the iris and allows light in. Because without it, you're blind. And that's so important to us to preserve and protect it. And we become the apple of God's eye. When we are right with him. When we've confessed. When we've made right. When we come with an open heart, we find the joy of the Lord overwhelms us. And particularly, we find a great confidence that we've been restored, that we've been made right with God. We come to make a fresh start. And this confidence that God is the wall around us. And God is the one that will shake his hand against our enemies. Because there will be many enemies in our lives in this church that will seek to discourage and disable but what a confidence it gives us when we have this restoration that God gives us when we've made right of past wrongs. Then in verse 3, the beautiful, amazing portion of scripture, I'm not going to do justice of it. My third point you see in chapter 3, my apologies, in chapter 3, and let's read the first five verses as a starting point. After the call of repentance, when we do repent, we find great confidence in the restoration that God gives us. And then we find that we become clothed in richness. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem to rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and they put the clothes on him. And the angel of the Lord stood by. What an amazing portion of scripture. Now, primarily the meaning refers to the nation of Israel. Joshua the high priest is representative. It is not speaking of him as an individual. Please understand that. It is speaking of him representing the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel had been deferred by their sin, their wickedness, uh, their idol worship. And oh, just before they were exiled, they were literally deferred. The words here, filthy garments are strong words. It speaks of excrement. Someone covered with excrement. And you know, the high priest was a significant spiritual a place in the nation of Israel and his robes, the high priest's robes were representative of purity and holiness and, and it was and there's so much said in the Leviticus about the high priest's robe and this picture is shocking shocking 
that the high priest in his full regalia is covered with excrement. It is disgusting. It is unacceptable. It is almost bringing up the fire in the picture, this, especially for the Jews. It, it is, a, it is a, a horrible thought. But this is what the nation of Israel were like. But God in his mercy showed them forgiveness. God in his mercy removed the filthy clothes and put on robes of riches, riches, rich robes. Now this picture was meant to be a great motivation for the nation of Israel. Yes, you were those sinful, wicked people. Yes, you were greatly punished. Yes, the nations at what and previous chapters, chapter two, spoke to that about the four, the horses and the chariots and all of that. And the four big uh, nations that came and affected them. But I have brought you back and I will make you into my people, cleanse you again. And this was to be a great motivation for the people of Israel to go. Is it not the greatest motivation for you and I today? Were we not also covered with the filth and the excrement of sin? Were we not each one of us also as we are to be condemned to the horriblest, hottest fires of hell? And yet, God in his mercy sought to take out those filthy garments of sin and give us garments of righteousness. Today, my brother and my sister, don't underestimate your position in Christ. You are a child of God, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. It is a high position. It is a noble position, not of anything of yourself, not of any good works, not of any merit, not of your standing, your stature, who you are as a person, your education, your status. In all of yourself, you're nothing but covered in filthy excrement. That's what we wear. But in the grace of God, that saw it fit to remove those filthy garments and clothe us in the righteousness of Christ. Today, we are just not anybody, not that we're proud, but we stand strong on the truth that we are children of a most high God. That we are sons and daughters of the God of heaven. We are clothed in garments of splendor, garments of righteousness, purchased by the blood of the Lamb. May we be motivated to serve in the local assembly, the church of God, which is his precious possession. May we be motivated with the right attitude, determined to come and serve. May we repent of our past. May we find great confidence in the restoration. May we find great motivation and encouragement in our garments of salvation. And then in the very next uh, few verses, just down in verse 8 of chapter 3, we see the coming of the righteous Lord who made this exchange of taking out the filthy garments and putting on rich robes possible. Verse 8, Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. And in my Bible, the word branch, full caps. And here is a beautiful picture of the coming of the righteous broad. The branch is referred to many times in the scripture, Old Testament especially. You can go at your own time and look at Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 33, a few verses in the Psalms, in Isaiah, referring, and, and especially in Jeremiah, refers to the branch of righteousness. Now the branch, you, when you do your study, which I'm not doing today, but it specifically refers to the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who made it possible, the one who stooped down from heaven and stood, stepped down into the sinful world, the one who was eternal, the Son of God, the glorious one, the eternal God who became a man and who went to the cross of Calvary and suffered and bled and died for unworthy sinners like us, the branch servant of God. The branch of righteousness, the one who hung on the cross, 
and shed his blood and died for us. As we are encouraged in the Lord to build the church of God, we look to the one who made it possible, who removed our filthy garments and gave us robes of riches so that we can be here today. You see, we don't qualify to be here today to build the house of God unless it was, it was, if it was not for the branch of God, the righteous one who made it possible. And then as we step into chapter 4, uh, another amazing portion of scripture, we see the completeness of our resources that are found in God. The completeness of our resources. Let's just read one verse in chapter 4, verse 6. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. In verse 10, for who has despised the day of small things. Now, chapter 4, it's an amazing picture. There's a seven-branch lampstand that he sees in his vision. And each of the seven branches have seven tubes that lead up to a lamp. Now, it's different from the lampstand that you find in the tabernacle. Uh, this lampstand is a picture of Israel. Seven lamps with seven pipes under each lamp leading to seven branches. And the light of the lamp is burning. But here's the amazing thing about this vision. It's not just the lamp itself, which was a picture of Israel. But there were two olive trees growing just behind the lampstand. And if you could imagine a tree with olives. And the olive oil was dripping from the tree directly into the lampstand. No one had to fill the lamp with oil for it to burn. The lamp was being filled with oil directly from the tree. It was a continuous filling. And you know what was happening? Zerubbabel felt hopeless. He and the people felt discouraged. They were few in number. They were being battered by their enemies. They had almost no resources. When they look back to Solomon, when he built the temple, wow. He had wealth untold and he had resources. Wow. He was able, they had almost nothing. But the Lord says to Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Verse 9, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? They seem just so hopeless. A few in number with no resources. You see, my brothers, my sisters, this may be our situation today here at Berario. If, if you look compared to many of the churches all over the world around us, we are so few in number with so little resources. There are three ways we can build the house of God in 2022 and going forward. By our own resources, but that's so weak, will fail by the resources of the world, but that also is temporary, but we can build by the Spirit of God. Don't despise small things. Don't despise small beginnings. Don't despise a little flock, a few children at Sunday school. I think our sisters have just about four, maybe five children today. Small number, we youth, five or six. Do we despise it? No, don't despise the day of small things or small beginnings. But when we build by the Spirit of God, His resources are unending. And He will enable and He will empower and He will give us absolutely everything we need. The source of our power is God, the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, that is in our midst today. Never, ever forget that when we seem discouraged, seem to be discouraged or feel hopeless, God is able. It's not by your might. It's not by your strength. It is but by the Spirit of God that His church is built. And we should give Him the glory. And then, crowning of the righteous Lord. Now, this is also so amazing, so symbolic. Uh, chapter 6, verses 11 and 13. Uh, 
we read, take the silver and the gold and make an elaborate crown, set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. Then speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, now listen, brethren and sisters, Behold the man whose name is the branch. From his place he shall branch out, and he shall, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace shall go, shall be between them both. Now, this was not a vision. Zechariah was instructed by God to go. There were three people, exiles, coming back, returning from Babylon. They were bringing gold and silver for the building of the church, building of the temple. And God told Zechariah, no, don't give the, let them give that money to build the temple. You go take it. You make an elaborate crown, golden crown. But what he was going to do with it was so surprising. Because up to that point in Israel's history, the priesthood and the royal line were separated. They could never be together. God made that forget. There was one king who tried to be a priest disobediently and paid a great price for it. But here Zechariah was told to crown the high priest. That was strange. It was a great symbolic picture, not of Joshua, not of Israel, not of any of the kings there or any of the high priests, but it was of the great high priest, the king of Israel, the Messiah, who was going to come and be the true one who could be both the king and the high priest at the same time. And he would build the temple. And this was a beautiful picture of the coming of the right crowning of the righteous Lord. And this is the reason we build the church of God here. It's because we are his servants. We are his hands. We are his lips. We are his feet. We are his body. He is building this church. When we are available, we recognize his lordship and his kingship and his priesthood, then he is able to build so we here today crown him the Lord of our meeting here today. And then uh, chapter 7, we see the captivity of the rebellious. This is important. Uh, you know, all, everything so far was quite positive, largely. And then suddenly something a little more negative in chapter 7, the captivity of the rebellious. What was this about? Let's look at it quickly. Verses 4 to 7. Then the word of the Lord came, sorry, then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, say to all the people in the land, of the land and to the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months during those 70 years, did you really fast for me? For me? When you eat and when you drink, did you not eat and drink to yourselves? For yourselves? Should you not have obeyed the words which the Lord proclaimed to the former prophets, when Jerusalem and the cities around it were inhabited and prosperous, and the south and the lowland were inhabited. Verse 9, ex ex execute true justice, show mercy and compassion, everyone to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless. Verse 11, but they refuse to eat. Now see, the story here is, the people of Israel had sinned greatly. They were being punished. They were in exile. While they were in exile, God in his word had clearly instructed you fast those certain days. You look and read the Pentateuch, Pentateuch and you find when you were supposed to fast. They were in exile in Babylon and decided we'll have a few extra days that we want to fast because we don't have our temple. Our temple will be destroyed. We are in exile. We want to fast for that. Now they were back. Now the temple was being rebuilt. So they asked Zechariah, why don't you ask God, must we continue that fast that we did in Babylon? Because now the temple is being built and God, <laughs> I can use that expression, ground his teeth in frustration with these people and, and says to them, really? Did I ask you to fast in Babylon? Was it my word? No, you chose to do it. 
But when you chose to do it, your heart was not in it. You did it almost mechanically as a tradition. And now you ask the question, don't worry about the tradition that you imposed upon yourself. Rather follow my commands, the word of God. And so this was a great rebuke to the people. If it's not a rebuke, then let it be an encouragement to us because uh, he clearly said the disobedience resulted, the rebellion resulted in captivity. See, that was the result of ineffective building, brothers and sisters. When we build the church of God, when we come here Sunday after Sunday, when we preach, when we share the Bible study, when we do anything that we do, when we wash dishes, when we teach Sunday school, uh, whatever it is that we do here in this local assembly. Uh, our brother Alan, and thank you, I'm referring to you again today, brother, what you said so powerful. Bring your heart along. Bring your heart along to church. Don't leave it at home. Don't leave it with your bank balance. Don't leave it with your work. Don't leave it with your hobbies. Bring your heart to do what you do here. Don't worry about tradition. Don't worry about mechanical. Don't worry about ticking a box. And because Brother Marlon put your name on a roster, so you have to do what you have to do. Otherwise, he's going to needle you with a WhatsApp message. Yeah, I do that. But what God wants us, the real effective building, is not tradition. It's not mechanical. It's when our heart is in it. Right, let's move on. I've got three more points, a few more minutes, and I think the Lord is uh, blessing. Let's go on. Then the coming of the royal Lord. I looked earlier at the coming of the righteous Lord. Now in chapter 9, verse 9, the coming of the royal Lord. We all know this well, quoted in all four of the Gospels, one of the most uh, referred to verses in this book, uh, 9 verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey. He called the fall of a donkey. This is so beautiful, a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. What we many call Palm Sunday today was fulfilled thoroughly in him. But the context is quite important. In the preceding verses of chapter 9, Zechariah has a vision of the nations and particularly his vision is of Alexander the Great of Greece. And particularly the vision as you study chapter 9 points to Alexander's conquest of the known world at that time. And how he rode into Jerusalem on his mighty stallion, coming powerful with an army behind him, entering into Jerusalem. It was a powerful picture brought in the first eight verses. And then this absolute contrast, a prophecy of the servant king that would come on a donkey. Wow. Compared to Alexander with his mighty army on a great stallion. Here comes the Messiah on a donkey, lowly and riding a donkey. It is a tremendous picture. It is a tremendous picture of the King of Kings and the Master and the Lord of our souls. He didn't come in pomp and glory. He came in great humility. Is he your king today? Or perhaps are we as fickle as the people that throw the clothes and the palm leaves down? Who said, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, look at the king, and they welcomed him. And then a week later, cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. May we not be as fickle. May the royal Lord be the king of kings in our hearts and souls. May he be our master and Lord. May it not be in mere words. May he be on the throne of our hearts. Now, chapter 10 is. This is quite an intense chapter. I'm going to literally rush through it, read two or three verses. Um, chapter 10, verses 2 and 3. And I'll tell you what it's all about now quickly. For the idols speak delusion, the diviners envision lies and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wend their ways like sheep. They are in trouble because there is no shepherd. My anger is kindled 
against the shepherds. In 11, chapter 11, verse 17, woe to the worthless shepherds who leave, who leaves the flock. Now, chapter 10 and 11 talks about three things. You will have to read for it yourself. It speaks first of the worthless shepherds, the worthless leaders of Israel who fed themselves, fattened themselves, allowed the false teachers and the idols of the nations around them to devour their people. And then it goes on to talk about the true shepherd who will come. But the true shepherd will actually make sure that there's discipline. And then they talks about the false shepherd, the ultimate false shepherd, the Antichrist. And yes, you will see all of that in those two chapters. The Antichrist and now he is the false shepherd. Now, in this, I would just give one comment and move on. Brethren, specifically to our elders and deacons, Sunday school, all the mature men who have a responsibility in the assembly one way or the other, the cowardice of the rulers really had a tremendous impact on the building of the Church of God. And there was great repercussion for that. May, may we not be found unworthy under shepherds. May we be found worthy shepherds of our homes, our children, and the Church of God. And then as I close, uh, the coming of the risen Lord, um, Chapter 12, verse 10, let's just read that verse. Chapter 12, verse 10, sorry. Even with the big writing, I need to focus. And I will call on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and the supplication. Then they will look at me, whom they pierce. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. In that, that day, there shall be a great morning in Jerusalem. In verse, chapter 14, verse 1, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. Now, chapters 12, 13, and 14 really dives deep into the future of Israel and the church and all of that. It speaks of the coming of the Lord. Now, it's not referred to here. It's inferred of the rapture of the church. The church, by the way, is... Let me get this right. Chapter 9, verse 9, and chapter 9, verse 10. It's that full stop. The entire church age in the book of Zechariah is like a mere full stop. In everything that you see here, that's how broad it is. But uh, the church gets raptured, and then when the Lord comes in the air to meet us and to call us up, the nation of Israel will see the risen Lord, the one they crucified, and their hearts will be broken in two. And they will mourn. And we don't understand the great details of the tribulation and the great tribulation of how many Jews get saved because of what they see and they mourning and, and how they come to know God and get saved, though they may not have God, the Holy Spirit. But then it also speaks, you can read a little further on, but he's coming back the second time physically and his feet touching on the Mount of Olives and the mountain splitting in two. It's all recorded here in this portion of scripture. And then the great, great war, the Armageddon, and then the great reward, behold, the day of the Lord's coming, the coming of the risen Lord. Now I will close with these thoughts. The Lord is coming. And as I said, this church age, the entire church age, the 2000 years, Thus far, whatever is to come before the Lord raptures us is denoted as a full stop in between two verses in this particular prophecy. Yet, it is an amazing part of the plan of God. And the Lord's going to come and he's going to rapture us and we're going to stand at the beamer seat of Christ. And he's going to ask, how did you build? How did you build your life? your faith, your home, your family? How did you build the Berario Assembly? The name of Zechariah. There's 27 men with the same name recorded in scripture. The Zechariah was both a priest and a prophet, but his name means whom Jehovah remembers, whom 
Jehovah remembers. I close with this question, my brother and my sister. The Lord will certainly remember us because of our position in Christ. What will he remember of your work in building the church of God that is recorded in eternity? May God give us the grace to be faithful, to seek to build his church, be used to build his church as we go into 2022 and forward. Last, uh, any one of our brothers is led to closing prayer. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity that we could sit under your word. Lord, we thank you for the conviction that the Holy Spirit brings upon us. Lord, we thank you for the boldness in which the word was expounded. And now, Lord, as the seed lands on the ground, we pray and ask that the birds of the air may not take it. And Lord, that it may not sprout in shallow ground or in thorny bushes, but that it may bear fruit. That we, as the small flock in your ordained gathering here, that we may be faithful and not despise small things. But Lord, come with our heart depending on your resources to build your house in which you are the king, Lord. And so we ask you for your mercies, even as we go upon this week, about this week, we pray that the word may linger long in our hearts, and Lord, that we may bear much fruit. Thank you for all that are present. Bless us all as we depart now. Bless us in this week ahead, and we pray and commit all of our time to your wondrous hand as we ask this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen.